Hello, everybody. It's a lovely fall day in New England, and this is a program on constitutional government at Harvard. I'm Harvey Mansfield with my wife, Anna. Our guest today is Lior Sapir. Lior is a fellow at the Manhattan Institute. He's an Israeli, and he went to college at the University of Haifa, and he got his PhD at Boston College. He's also had a postdoc here at the Program on Constitutional Government at Harvard. And he's written a dissertation on Title IX, especially on um, gender identity and trans, uh, transgenderism. So and this dissertation is unusually comprehensive and deep because it considers not only policy, but also constitutional law and even political philosophy. So Lior Sapir uh, writes, especially for City Journal, though he has an article in the latest National Review uh, called School to Clinic Pipeline. And the title of his uh, remarks today is The Controversy Over Pediatric Gender Medicine in the US. And I'm gonna translate that is, as, should kids have a sex change? Maybe he'll object to that, but anyway, Go ahead, Lior. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Harvey and um, Andy and, and Anna for having me here. Um, it's always a pleasure to be back in this forum. Um, <clears throat> uh, as Harvey mentioned, I wrote my dissertation on the institutional and uh, legal foundation of um, the encroachment of Title IX regulation into the trans issue. Um, and it, it drew quite a bit on, uh, on, on political philosophy. But around 2020, um, I started to get sucked into the medical debates themselves um, over pediatric gender transition or uh, sex changes for, uh, for children. Um, and um, ever since, you know, it's one of these topics where once you look, you can't look away. Um, because I, I am convinced that this is one of the greatest medical scandals in American history. Um, it may not be on the scale of, let's say, the opioid epidemic, which at its peak claimed 70,000 lives in one year, um, but because it involves children um, and because it involves thousands, if not tens of thousands of children who have already gone through the medical track, um, uh, and considering the extremely weak to non-existent evidentiary basis for these procedures, which I'll get into, um, I think this really is a, one of the biggest scandals um, unfolding. Um, and I, I, I've been working not just to, to try to uh, clarify what's been going on, but also to try to get policymakers to pay attention, um, follow the science where it actually leads, um, and, and do what, what they should be doing. So I'm going to be sharing my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Um, and let's just make sure that this works. Okay. All right. Can everybody see? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so the topic of my talk is the controversy over pediatric gender medicine in the United States. Um, it's going to have some comparisons with other countries, but um, it's obviously going to focus on the United States. Uh, now, the background to this is skyrocketing rates of transgender self-identification among youth. Um, so just uh, in terms of definitions, um, the word transgender is, is used very, very loosely these days. It, it uh, tends to mean quite a few things, some, 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 some of them uh, not always consistent with each other. Um, so it's sometimes used to, uh, to talk about- Hi people who cross uh, between one sex and the other or claim to cross from male to female or female to male. Um, but it could also refer to just a variety, a kind of garden variety, gender nonconformity, right? So, you know, the teenage girl who's a tomboy, for example, um, can today consider herself transgender and she will be considered transgender on surveys in schools by medical professionals. Um, all these new labels like non-binary, gender fluid, 
Um, anybody who is not, as they like to put it, cisgender, meaning anybody who doesn't, um, who, who isn't a man and defines himself as a man or a woman and defines herself as a woman is nowadays a potential candidate for being transgender. Um, a Gallup poll from earlier this year found that among Generation Y, so those born after 1997, 2.1% identify as transgender. Um, and that's in comparison to 1% of millennials, 0.6% of Gen X, and 0.1% of boomers. So you can see that the rates are, are skyrocketing. Um, but even this doesn't tell the whole story because when you start to look at particular places in the country, it's gonna surprise no one that um, the more progressive the place, the higher the, the um, level of self-identification, um, you start to see even higher numbers. So there's one study by uh, Kid et al. in uh, 2018 um, of a school district in Pittsburgh that found 9.2% of the students in that school district um, had a, and these are their words, had a gender identity that was different from the sex assigned to them at birth. So technically transgender, right? So one in 10 kids born in the wrong body. And so this raises the question, um, what are we seeing? Are we seeing, what, what, what explains this um, dramatic surge in transgender identification among young people? And there are two hypotheses. One is the social acceptance hypothesis that basically says, um, you know, these kids uh, have always existed. The rates that we're seeing are completely normal. Um, the only thing that's changed is that society has become more tolerant, more accepting. Um, and therefore, these kids feel more comfortable coming out and, and, and telling everybody who they truly are. So that's the social acceptance hypothesis. But then there's also the social contagion hypothesis, which says that trans identification is primarily or exclusively um, a fad, um, you know, a, a, a kind of a, a thing that teenagers influence each other into doing. Um, that there are all these kind of cultural cues and social incentives that, that um, get uh, kids and particularly girls, we'll get into that, um, to identify in this way. Um, and that's known as the social contagion hypothesis. Okay, so let's get into some of the evidence for each one of these. So the social acceptance hypothesis, as I said, assumes that, um, that trans kid, that first of all, that there is this category of individuals called trans kids. Um, that people are born like this. Um, they, they're born with a gender identity that doesn't match their, their sex. Um, usually this is couched in the analogy to gay rights, just as uh, gay people are born that way, so too trans people are. Um, especially in the context of civil rights regulation in the federal courts, advocacy organizations have made claims about brain sex, meaning that gender identity has a neurological foundation um, but there really is no good evidence for these claims. Um, the, the, the claims on behalf of a neurological basis are based on um, uh, studies with a very, very small um, cohort, um, the most famous of them having examined only six adult transsexuals. Um, and, and even then it could not control for confounding factors like homosexuality. Um, so there really is a very, very weak basis for the neurological explanation. And so instead, um, it's inferred psychologically um, by the consistency or the tenacity of a person's assertions, right? And this also appears in psychological literature. They acknowledge this point that we don't, we don't yet know what causes a person to reject their sex. Um, all we can know is, is uh, you know, we can infer things based on their behavior. Um, and another reason to doubt the kind of the, the uh, neurological or innate explanation of, of gender identity is that the vast majority of kids who exhibit these behaviors and who are diagnosed with gender dysphoria historically, um, uh, 11 studies have shown, will desist, meaning they'll come to terms with their sex by puberty. Um, and, um, and the vast majority then, by the way, will come out as gay or lesbian. Um, whereas in contrast, close to 0% of gay or lesbian people spontaneously become heterosexual, right? So that's kind of more evidence that the whole gender identity being a brain sex explanation um, uh, lacks evidence. Um, I should also note that there's a tension within the social acceptance argument, which is that um, 
the, the same people making that argument often claim that we are living in times of unprecedented hostility towards trans people. Um, and, and for exactly that reason, we need a, a robust civil rights program um, to protect trans people from, from, social, from growing social hostility. So it's not clear how those two um, arguments can fit together, that more kids are coming out because society is more welcoming, but society has unprecedented levels of hostility and therefore we need civil rights protections. And usually there's a, a, a comparison made with left-handedness. If, any, if anybody um, happened to see John Oliver's segment on this from the other day, which was very uh, wildly popular uh, in the media, um, this is a common comparison, right? The argument is that um, left-handedness used to be discouraged in schools. Um, and when it was, only 4% of students were left-handed. But when it was permitted, when teachers allowed students to write with their left hand, um, by 1960, 12% of students um, wrote and, um, and did everything with their left hand, so a rise of 300%. Um, but looking at the numbers alone, as, I've, as I list here, shows that that, that analogy is highly implausible. Um, just, among, just if you take transgender self-identification, the numbers have risen by 2,100% between the baby boom generation and generation Y, right? So already we're talking about orders of magnitude bigger. And then if you look at gender dysphoria, which is the clinical diagnosis of a mismatched um, uh, uh, self-perceived sex and actual sex accompanied usually by uh, distress or social impairment, um, you see that the, uh, that the rates since 2013, when the um, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders first listed them, um, the rates similarly have skyrocketed. And this is based on data recently released by Komodo Health. Um, I'm not gonna go through all the statistics here, all the data, but I did some number crunching and suffice to say that among males, the rates of gender dysphoria in youth have gone up between 428% and 1,200%. And among females, the rates of gender dysphoria have gone up um, between 4,000 and 6,000%. So we're not talking about the same degree of rise in, in, uh, as we saw with left-handedness. And keep in mind that unlike with left-handedness where the 300% increase happened over a period of 60 years, here these um, very dramatic numbers happened over the course of 10 years. Right? So this is not smoking gun evidence of social contagion, but it strongly suggests that something more than just social acceptance is afoot. Something else has to explain why so many kids have come out as trans or uh, are being diagnosed with gender dysphoria in such a short period of time. Um, and one of the, uh, another indicator I think of evidence for social contagion um, is number one, that we know of other historic examples of social contagion. Incidentally, um, social contagions with, which have affected the exact same demographic as the trans slash gender dysphoria social contagion, which is young, um, young females, uh, young female adolescents and young women, right? That's the primary group affected by this. So the Salem witch trials, um, uh, th there was a social contagion in uh, bulimia in the 1980s and 1990s, same with anorexia during the same period. Um, nowadays, there's another social contagion known as spoonies. This is when um, teenage girls and young women um, uh, self-diagnose with, um, with health conditions that they don't have, um, and they live a life of somebody who is completely impaired and unable to do anything, even though they're perfectly healthy. Um, and then, of course, in the 1990s, we had the recovered memory movements, right? The claim that um, young women who experience anxiety, depression, any form of um, mental health problems, it's probably because of some past sexual abuse that they've repressed and can't remember. Um, so this turned out to be a whole scandal, but, but it, it, it spread like a wildfire um, over the course of about a decade among young um, uh, teenage girls and young women. We also are seeing celebration of the trans um, identity in pop culture. Um, so, you know, brands like Jazz Jennings, who produce books and movies and TV shows for kids. Um, you can see it in the language in which uh, mainstream media and political leaders talk about um, uh, gender issues. 
Um, so for example, to be transgender by definition, according to most advocacy organizations, um, mainstream media journalists, um, by definition, being trans means not conforming to expectations regarding your sex, right? So this sends a message to kids who are very concerned about questions of conformity and authenticity, that if you're not trans, it's because you're conforming. Um, and if you are trans, it's because you're being authentic, which is another watchword. And I included here um, on the left, you can see um, the gender spectrum. Um, it's really a meme because it's used everywhere now. But um, this is, uh, it comes from a, a training material from um, the UK's uh, most important transgender advocacy organization called Mermaids. Um, and what's interesting in this meme is that you can see the, the way in which they define male and female, right? The so-called gender binary. And you can see on the left to be uh, a woman means to be a Barbie, right? It means to, to, to want to have for oneself all of the most two-dimensional stereotypical features of femininity and to define oneself as a man means to be a GI Joe, right? Um, and if you're not a Barbie or GI Joe, then that means that you're something other than male or female, right? So you're somewhere in the middle, you're on the spectrum, um, all these metaphors about sex being a spectrum. Um, and, you know, so this is shown to kids as young as kindergarten, and it's impressed upon them that if you don't see yourself as being either a Barbie or a G.A. Joe, um, that probably means that you're trans. That is the messaging. So given this language, it's not surprising that more and more kids who say to themselves, well, I don't feel like Barbie, um, therefore I must be trans, right? So. Um, this is just some of the stuff that's appeared in recent years in pop culture, you know, National Geographic celebrating trans kids on its cover. Um, you can see here, um, this right over here, if you can see where my mouse is, um, that is from a book called Bodies Are Cool. Um, it's a book for kids in, uh, age kindergarten and up. And you can see that they are celebrating a clearly young woman who had a double mastectomy. That's what these scars are right here. Um, and this is marketed to kids. Um, over here on the bottom right, you can see this appears from a very popular Reddit thread, these two young girls who clearly had double mastectomies, um, again, marketed to young kids as being authentic and courageous. Um, and then you can see these other, uh, uh, pictures from, from um, popular children's books these days. These are books that appear in Barnes and Noble and Amazon. Um, they're very, very easy to find and get. Okay, so uh, one of the ways in which we have come to know the social contagion hypothesis is through this new clinical um, category called rapid onset gender dysphoria, ROGD. And this has become the source of major controversy in the um, debate over pediatric gender medicine. Um, Abigail Schreier um, uh, drew it, uh, attention to it in her book, Irreversible Damage, that appeared a couple of years ago. Um, but the concept comes from a research paper by Lisa Littman in 2018, um, where she surveyed um, uh, parents of these teenage girls, primarily girls, um, who all of a sudden exhibited these dysphoric behaviors um, in, in or after puberty, right? So these are not kids who had a long history of, um, of uh, having dysphoria in childhood. They're mostly teenage girls who just all of a sudden um, uh, started exhibiting these, these signs and symptoms. And what Littman found is that there were some pretty common patterns. These were young girls um, uh, spent an enormous amount of time on social media, especially in the months leading up to their trans uh, identification. Um, many of them had, uh, were socially isolated, um, were socially awkward, and probably for that reason, socially isolated. Um, and they were deeply immersed in social justice culture. Um, so they were constantly thinking and talking about victimhood and oppression. Um, intersectionality, they were, you know, that was a, 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 ma a major watchword there. Um, they were constantly concerned about hierarchies, um, social hierarchies. You know, I have to say, uh, one of the uh, articles I wrote for City Journal, I interviewed um, about a dozen parents from California whose kids had gone through this. And one of the consistent themes that these parents told me 
is that their kids um, in the months leading up to their identification, they're coming out as trans and they're, they're wanting to do some form of transition. Um, you know, they got a lot of messaging uh, on the kind of the racial issue, right? That, that um, society is, um, is inherently racist, uh, white supremacist, that as young white girls, they are inheritors of a system of privilege, um, that they need to be quiet and listen to and defer to people of color. Um, uh, and what these young girls started to notice, according to their parents, is that it was very easy for them to opt out of being at the very bottom of the totem pole of, of victimhood, right? All they had to do was declare themselves queer or non-binary. Um, that doesn't require anything on their part. It just means all they have to do is say, from now on, I'm just queer, that's it. And all of a sudden, they, they go one up um, on the ladder. Um, and what we've come to know since then is that these identities, queer, non-binary, gender fluid, are almost always stepping stones to um, trans, to want to cross the barrier and, and, and identify as males, um, partly because teenage girls say, well, if you're really committed to this, you'll show it. And you'll show it by, by demanding hormones and puberty blockers and, and mastectomies and all these things, right? So teenage girls pressure one, uh, one another into um, showing that they're committed to this. Now I should point out that Littman's paper was not supposed to be you know, definitive proof of social contagion. It's often presented that, that way as a straw man to say that because she didn't prove it, it's not true. Um, it was always meant to be a hypothesis generating paper. She writes that explicitly. She said, you know, here's a phenomenon that I'm seeing. It's pretty common. We need a lot more research before we carry forth with all these medical uh, procedures. And in the years since Lisa's, um, um, paper came out, her uh, hypothesis has been confirmed in a number of ways. One is by the experience of clinicians on the ground in a variety of countries, in Finland, in Sweden, the UK, Canada, and here, of course, in the United States. Um, what these clinicians have noticed is a flip, and this appears in, in peer-reviewed research too, um, a flip in the sex ratio so that um, until about a decade ago, the majority of, of uh, minors being referred to pediatric gender clinics were male, whereas now the vast majority are female. Um, whereas up until about a decade ago, the vast majority had early onset gender dysphoria, meaning it started uh, uh, well before puberty. Um, nowadays, it starts around or a little after puberty for the vast majority of people. And um, these young girls had extraordinarily high rates of co-occurring psychological problems, including anxiety, depression, eating and learning disorders, um, uh, uh, autism. Um, actually, the UK's Tavistock Clinic in a review, um, it was found that up to one third of all the girls referred to the Tavistock had either autism or some other kind of neurodivergent condition. Um, so, so something is going on here. And um, Ken Zucker, who's one of the most um, uh, prominent world-renowned um, uh, researchers on pediatric uh, um, gender dysphoria, um, wrote in a peer-reviewed article in 2019 that uh, uh, the observations that Littman had made um, comport with what he was seeing with the majority of his patients. Um, and it's also confirmed by firsthand accounts of parents and teachers and a lot of the kids who have gone through this and come out the other side and said, you know, what have I done? And so there are all these new kind of parent groups like uh, Pitt is the parents for inconvenient truths about trans, uh, parents of ROGD kids, um, and so on and so forth. All these parent groups have formed in response as support networks in response to this problem. And these are just two diagrams for um, what we've been seeing in, uh, uh, based on data collected at gender clinics from other countries. And I should note, um, one of the big problems we have in the United States is that we don't collect good data. Uh, because our system is so decentralized. Um, but in countries that have centralized healthcare systems that do collect data, um, there's a, a clear trend here. And you can see on the left here, this is from the Tavistock Clinic, which has since been ordered to close. You can see that the share of adolescent females um, with no history of, um, of early onset uh, um, dysphoria uh, began to skyrocket around 2012. Um, and, you know, by 2016, they made up the lion's share of referrals. Um, and the same thing happened in Sweden. 
Okay, so with this in the background, this kind of debate of what's causing all these young people to identify as trans and seek, and many of them to seek medical transition. Um, what is gender affirming care? Let me lay some assumptions and some definitions on the table. Um, let's first deal with the philosophical assumptions. Um, the word identity here is used to refer to a, a person's core sense of self, or as uh, activists like to call it, knowledge. Of course, the whole uh, one of the big arguments is whether this sense, which is a kind of an intuition or a feeling, does in fact amount to knowledge, um, uh, or or is it opinion or some kind of feeling? Um, but regardless, uh, identity is is conceived here as as the locus of human dignity. Um, is something that's in, intrinsically valuable and worth um, uh, protecting, preserving, um, asserting, recognizing. Um, gender is used to mean an essential, natural, and good trait. It's not meant in the way that, let's say, queer theory means it, if you read uh, Judith Butler, for example, which is something like uh, a system of social oppression. Um, right, so when people talk about gender ideology and say that gender ideology has infiltrated into medicine, that's not exactly true, or at least it requires some clarification. Because if people like, you know, Michel Foucault and Gen Judith Butler are to be consulted, um, I think you can see pretty clearly on the basis of their writings, this idea that kids are born with a, the brain of the opposite sex and need to be medically managed and transitioned to be, so to speak, authentic. Um, goes against the grain of what queer theory um, argues. Um, but in any case, um, the idea is that all humans have a gender identity um, and that this identity is innate, potentially even biological, that it's knowable through intuition, a kind of a lived experience, even from a very, very early age, and that it's not subject to change once it emerges. So you have the influential um, Bay Area child psychologist, Diane Ehrensoft, making claims like children as young as two know who they are. And when it comes to, to gender, children are our teachers, right? That's the, those are the kinds of arguments that she makes. Meanwhile, sex is regarded as a social construct. Um, uh, therefore, the use of the language that sex is assigned at birth um, and it's therefore also arbitrary and potentially oppressive unless it's autonomously chosen. Chosen, of course, by that self that has a gender, right, the gender identity. Um, further, it's conceived that the alignment or misalignment of gender identity and sex is an accident of birth, right? One is born with alignment or misalignment. There's nothing one can do about it. Um, and misalignment is not pathological. It's not unnatural in the sense of abnormal. Um, and that's why uh, uh, the, the term gender identity disorder, which appeared in the DSM three and four, um, was replaced in 2013 with a more neutral term, um, gender dysphoria. Um, and the reason was that they wanted to retain a clinical diagnosis in order to, for insurance purposes, but they wanted to try to destigmatize it as much as possible. So the word disorder was, was dispensed with. And of course, in any clash between gender identity and assigned sex, um, gender identity always has to triumph. Okay, so these are the, the, the basic philosophical assumptions behind gender affirming care. Um, just to kind of uh, uh, polish some of what I was saying earlier, the diagnosis of gender dysphoria, according to DSM-5, uh, requires two components. There has to be some kind of persistent cross-gender behavior and interestingly, the DSM-5 speaks explicitly of stereotypes. One has to um, conform to the stereotypes of the opposite sex and one's desires and, and behavior. But there also has to be clinically significant distress um, or so, some kind of social impairment like uh, dysfunction at school. Now in theory, gender dysphoria is distinct from transgender. Right, um, the uh, trans movement constantly insists that um, not all transgender people have gender dysphoria, that one shouldn't have to have a diagnosis in order to be considered trans. Um, but in practice, if we look at the politics of civil rights regulation, the two are synonymous. Um, so in any case, uh, you know, any kind of federal litigation where the question of trans rights comes up, um, whether it's in the medical context or the Title IX context, 
Um, the claim is always that that um, if we if we don't uh, um, do these policies, people with gender dysphoria are going to suffer and probably kill themselves. Right. So in practice, the two are, are synonymous. <clears throat> and here I just have some kind of a visualization of the rates of gender dysphoria diagnosis among youth under 18. And what you can see is that between 2017 and 2020, there was a 20% annual growth, which is pretty significant in itself. And then between 2020 and 2021, that uh, the, the rates skyrocketed by 80%. And these are new diagnoses. So of course, you know, I, I think the most reasonable explanation is the pandemic. The social isolation brought about the, by the pandemic is probably the culprit behind the 80% um, growth in, in one single year. Um, and so that brings the current total to 121,882 cases of gender dysphoria among youth diagnosed. Um, and keep in mind, this is based on insurance claims. So it very likely underestimates the true number. Okay, so the gender affirming care protocol has four stages. Um, social transition, which is using a person's preferred name, pronouns, um, bathroom access, sports teams access, stuff like that. Um, puberty blockers begin around age 11 or 12, depending. Um, and their purpose is really to just um, suppress the emergence of secondary sex characteristics, which are said to cause distress. Um, following puberty blockers are cross-sex hormones, so masculinizing or feminizing, depending on the, on the purpose. Um, and, um, and, and then finally, surgeries. And not everybody gets surgeries, but, um, but they do happen. Um, there's, so to speak, top surgery, which is a euphemism for a double mastectomy, and bottom surgery, which is a euphemism for phalloplasty or vaginoplasty, as the case might be. And surgeries are performed, both top and bottom are performed on minors in the United States. We've had politicians and activists deny it, but we have hard evidence, even from peer reviewed medical journals where researchers um, proudly flaunt the fact that kids are getting, these, are getting these surgeries. So they do happen. And gender affirming care has the endorsement of pretty much the entire left of center elite. Um, I know that sounds a little bit conspiratorial, but it's 100% accurate. Um, the idea that gender affirming care is medically necessary and life saving has received endorsement from 22 major medical associations, including the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Medical Association, the American Psychological Association. Um, it's the position, it's the official position of the ACLU, the Human Rights Campaign, and of course, the Democratic Party. Um, but the United States has really become an outlier on pediatric gender medicine. And one of the things that I've been trying to do uh, in my work is number one, explain this to policymakers. Um, and number two, try to understand why we've become such an outlier. And I'll get to that at the end. But um, since 2009, Sweden, Finland, and the UK have done what are known as systematic reviews of the evidence for the mental health benefits of hormones to treat gender dysphoria in youth. Um, and all three countries have come to the same conclusion that the benefits are too uncertain to justify the potential risks. And so all three countries have drastically scaled back on medical transition. Um, they now recommend psychotherapy as the first and ideally only line of treatment for youth in distress. Um, and they permit ex uh, exceptional cases to go through with medical transition, but only under a strict research protocol. Um, the UK uh, NHS recently ordered its main pediatric gender clinic at the Tavistock to be closed um, and treatment to be decentralized into regional clinics where the hope is that uh, uh, mental health counseling will be uh, more readily available as opposed to endocrine interventions. Um, what's interesting is that Dr. Hilary Cass, who's the former president of the uh, UK College of Pediatricians and Child Health, and who conducted the investigation of the Tavistock Clinic, um, she explicitly targeted, uh, um, uh, focused on the what she called the affirmative model of care, which she said originated in the United States as being a lack of a, a reason behind the lack of child safeguarding at the Tavistock. Um, so I thought that was that was pretty interesting. Um, meanwhile, France, the uh, uh, medical authorities in France have also issued a statement urging great caution 
in the use of hormones to treat adolescents, um, uh, minors in distress, given the, the lack of good evidence behind it. But that's not the position that American medical organizations, I should say that the, with, with very few exceptions that the medical, uh, uh, American medical establishment as a whole has taken. Um, what's interesting is that when you start to dig into all of these pronouncements by you know, the, the American Medical Association, which is by far the largest of them, what you notice is that they're basically based, um, they, 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 they only, uh, it's like an inverted pyramid at the bottom of which are really um, two uniquely American organizations that have actually made claims based on any cited research. And that's the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Endocrine Society. Um, the AAP, which if any of you have been following my work, you know that I've almost virtually gone to war with them. Um, they base their recommendation on a single article published in 2018. Um, the article was not peer reviewed, appears to have not been peer reviewed. And it was written by a medical resident at the time with very little clinical experience. And most importantly, in a subsequent peer reviewed fact check of the article, the 2018 article, it turned out that um, uh, uh, Dr. Jason Rafferty, who was the author, completely misrepresented all of the sources. So when he said, for example, that um, children should never be automatically transitioned, um, it turned all of the sources that he cited to, to, in support of that claim said the exact opposite. That it's, they said children should not be automatically transitioned. Instead, there should be a process known as watchful waiting where they're not affirmed in their gender identity. Um, and, and the medical transition should be delayed as much as possible. Um, and another thing that Rafferty did was omit all studies that show that affirmation is not the right thing to do. Um, there were 11 such studies that show that the vast majority of kids, if they're just left alone, will come to feel comfortable in their bodies and will not seek transition anymore. And he just doesn't mention those studies. Um, so that's, that's the evidentiary basis of the AAP. Um, Regarding the endocrine society, it's important to recognize number one, that their, their recommendations are not for whether minors should be transitioned. Instead, they say, if you decide to transition a, a minor, here's what we recommend, here's how we recommend to do it. So they're, they're, te they're technicians. Um, and um, the endocrine society, interestingly, in 2017 um, issued its guidelines and it rated the evidence behind its own recommendations as being of quote, low or very low quality. Um, and it, it called its own recommendations weak. Um, and I should point out aside from these, uh, uh, sorry, including these uh, two organizations, no American Medical Association has ever done a systematic review of evidence for, um, for medical interventions. Um, why is this important? Because a systematic review of the evidence of the kind that UK, Sweden, and Finland have done is uh, designed to prevent the kind of thing that Jason Rafferty did with the AAP, which is to cherry pick studies in order to, pr to produce convenient conclusions. That's why we, do, we have systematic evidence reviews. And right now, American medical practice is not based on a systematic review of the evidence. The only exception is actually the state of Florida which as we speak is holding hearings to finalize its rule to ban pediatric transitions subject to certain limitations. Okay, so what does the research on puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones actually say? And here there's two relevant categories of research. I'm not gonna get into it because it's, uh, I can if you want in the Q and A, but it's, it's very, very dense and complicated. But suffice to say that there's two bodies of evidence. One is the famous, famous Dutch study um, that came out of the Netherlands. Uh, its results were published in a number of articles, most importantly ones in 2011 and 2014. Um, and the other is uh, includes uh, uh, about a dozen or so studies that have been published since the Dutch uh, study. Um, uh, but both of these bodies of evidence are extremely weak. The Dutch study is weak because it suffers from um, bias. So to give just a couple examples, it utilizes what's known as the Utrecht gender dysphoria scale. So essentially what it does is it takes a bunch of boys, it gives them puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones. And then at the end of the process, it asks them, um, do you feel, uh, how do you feel about um, getting your period? And of course, none of them are getting periods. So, um, so they write zero, meaning it doesn't bother me at all. But 
these same boys got the questionnaire for boys, not for girls at the beginning of the process. And when they got the questionnaire for boys, questions like, how do you feel about having a penis? Um, they rated their dysphoria or their distress as being extremely high. So by changing the questions from boy-centered questions to girl-centered questions, the researchers got a, a, a reduction of dysphoria from very, very high to almost non-existent. Um, so they've come under a lot of criticism for this, but that's they, they're sticking to their guns. Um, and there are a number, a number of other problems with the Dutch study. It did not control for psychotherapy. So all the kids who got hormones also got psychotherapy and there was no way to know which of those two interventions was causing the improvement. They had very short follow-up time from the um, completion of transition, only a year and a half. Um, and um, <clears throat> the only attempt so far to replicate the Dutch study happened in the UK a couple of years ago and the attempt failed. Um, and we know that replication is essential to medical research, um, to scientific research. Uh, interestingly, the researchers who tried to replicate did not want to publish their findings, um, but were eventually forced to. And then the final problem with the Dutch study is that because of all the criteria for eligibility for which kids are allowed and not allowed to participate in the hormones, um, if you look at the criteria for, for eligibility, they don't apply to the vast majority of teenagers showing up today at gender clinics. Um, and so that means that to the extent that you do think the Dutch study is a good one, um, you don't think that it applies to the vast majority of kids who are actually getting hormones today and surgeries. We could talk more about that if you'd like in the Q&A. Um, regarding the subsequent studies, um, some of these stubby studies have showed no improvement in mental health. Um, some of them showed improvement, but um, they, were, uh, they either had very short follow-up times, anywhere, usually anywhere between three months and one year, which is not nearly enough to know if they actually improve quality of life in the long run. They had confounding variables, so they had the same problem with not, uh, no ability to control for psychotherapy, and they had biased samples, meaning only those kids who were um, uh, somewhat mentally stable were allowed to, to get the hormones in the first place, whereas those kids who had a lot of mental health problems, anxiety, depression, things like that, were not allowed to get hormones. And then by the end of the study, the researchers see, say, see, those with hormones do much better than those without hormones, right? But they're just measuring what they, their own um, criteria for eligibility, uh, not, not the causal effects of hormones on mental health. So I'm not gonna go through this too much. Suffice to say that puberty blockers have a number of risks. Some of them are known, some of them are unknown. Uh, they include cognitive impairment, osteoporosis early in life, um, sterility, anxiety, and depression. Um, what is important here is that a, a, a major claim made on behalf of the gender affirming care is that puberty blockers are fully reversible. Is that the, the second, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever heard this claim being made, but that the second uh, a teenager stops taking them, everything just goes back to, to normal and, and they can um, carry forth with puberty as intended. Um, it turns out that there have been three studies in recent years on how many kids who get puberty blockers go on to cross-sex hormones and virtually all of them do, um, which leads any kind of uh, you know, thoughtful observer to say, um, this is pretty strong evidence of iatrogenesis, which means uh, an illness that is the cause of a medical intervention itself. Um, because the only other explanation is that clinicians are remarkably efficient at avoiding false positives, right? At picking out the exact kids who are good candidates and leaving out those who are not good candidates. And there just is zero evidence for that being the case. And it also, I think, is um, very, uh, it, it offends common sense to believe that. Um, so in any case, it's, you know, puberty blockers, there have been no randomized control trials. They are not FDA approved for this purpose. Um, um, and um, recognizing these points, the Health Authority of Finland um, now considers them uh, a medical experimentation, uh, which they are. Cross-sex hormones and surgeries also have their risks, both known and unknown. Um, sterility, heightened risk of cancer and heart disease, anxiety and depression. Medical leash means that once you start taking them, especially if it's in conjunction with other procedures, you're on them for life, um, even if you come to regret it. Um, surgeries, of course, are irreversible and they have very high rates of complication. Um, not to get too graphic, but these things are important. 
But um, for boys who go through puberty blockers, um, because they go through, uh, they use puberty blockers, their, their penis is not allowed to develop. And because the creation of a neo-vagina later on requires the, in, the surgical inversion of the penis uh, to create an orifice and it's not big enough, they have to borrow from the colon in order to create a, a, a neo-vagina. Um, and that opens up a, a, a lots, of, um, a, a lots of health risks and complications. Um, and actually the, the TV star Jazz Jennings, that's exactly the story behind um, Jazz's uh, uh, um, health, health complications right now. Um, and we have no long-term follow-up data on uh, any of these medical interventions for minors, puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, or surgeries. There just is no data. Um, let me say a few words on social transition because this is highly relevant for schools, for the educational context. And that this is going to be a major um, political battleground um, uh, going into the midterms and I think the 2024 presidency um, because uh, the, the whole problem of gender instruction, gender ideology in schools is, a, is becoming a major flashpoint. Um, when schools agree to use a child's uh, pronouns and names, um, what they are effectively doing is socially transitioning that child, right? Um, the ACLU has said so explicitly in its Title IX lawsuits. Um, and um, it's important to recognize, and one of the things that I've been trying to bring to the awareness of policymakers is that social transition is a medical intervention. It's not just some neutral act of kindness by teachers. Um, and the, the evidence backs this up. Um, and I should point out the schools are now doing it increasingly without the consent of parents and sometimes without even notifying the parents. Um, so uh, as I said, there's no evidence of an innate and fixed gender identity and 12 studies on the rates of desistance and persistence among youth with gender dysphoria um, show that, um, it's, that it's an iatrogenic intervention. Why? Because 11 of these studies show, as I mentioned earlier, that the vast majority of these kids will desist by puberty. They will no longer reject their sex. Most of them will come out as gay or lesbian. The only study that showed otherwise came out earlier this year, and it showed that 97.5% of the kids who were socially trained uh, uh, in the study did not desist, meaning they did not come to terms with their body. The only difference between this study and the previous 11 studies is that the kids in the 2020 study were all socially transitioned. So if that's not a good evidence of iatrogenesis, I don't know what is. It's as if we were to take toddlers who play with building blocks, um, put all of them in vocational schools, encourage them to uh, identify themselves as construction workers, and then later when 98% of them say, I want to be construction workers, um, we pride ourselves on being remarkably effective at predicting adult vocational preferences in toddlerhood. Um, so in any case, social transition is not innocent gender exploration. It greatly increases the chance of medicalization. And that's why what schools are, are doing right now is um, just extremely irresponsible. And the UK has recently advised caution on social transition. Um, the CAST report said it's not a neutral act. It constitutes an active psychosocial intervention. Two weeks ago, the NHS issued new draft guidance basically saying, don't socially transition kids. And if you're gonna socially transition teenagers, um, you should only do so if they have a diagnosis of gender dysphoria and on the basis of informed consent. Um, and yet the American Academy of Pediatrics continues to maintain that all kids should be automatically affirmed, meaning socially transitioned, no questions asked. And if parents have a problem with that, this appears in the AAP article, the parents are the ones who need to get psychological counseling. Um, I'm not gonna go through the whole, you know, the, the two most common arguments in favor of gender affirming care is that kids are gonna kill themselves if they're not allowed to do it. I'm happy to get back to this in the Q and A. Suffice to say that, that the evidence for that claim is extremely weak. Um, and actually the claim is very likely to do more damage than, um, than more harm than good. Um, the claims about regret rates being extremely low um, are based on studies done on adults. Um, we have no way of knowing what the re actual regret rate is going to be for, for the cur current cohort of minors transitioned under the gender affirming protocol. Um, 
And then finally, before I end, I'll just kind of get into some of the uh, regulatory actions undertaken um, in recent years. Um, right now, there are four states that have tried to prohibit gender affirming care. Um, Alabama tried, it got blocked in a federal court uh, in a uh, preliminary injunction hearing um, by a judge who was appointed by Donald Trump and has sympathies with the Federalist Society. Um, he basically only allowed the, the prohibition of surgeries to go through, um, but he blocked the two provisions um, um, banning hormones. Um, Arizona has a, a law like this. It's set to go in, into effect next year. Arkansas is currently under litigation. Um, I think the trial ended a few days ago, but don't quote me on that. Um, and then Tennessee technically has a law in the books, but it's a very odd law because it basically says no cross-sex hormones to children before puberty, but that's never really been part of the protocol anyway. Um, 19 additional states have proposed similar bills, um, but these have either died or are still kind of wending their way through the legislature. Um, and then on the blue side, you have states like California that have taken aggressive measures to try to make gender affirming care as readily available as possible. So earlier this year, California passed SB 107, which basically creates, uh, sets up California as a sanctuary state for gender affirming care. And what it does in practice is it says to um, authorities in, in the state of California, if there is ever a, um, you know, a, if, if a minor shows up in the state and wants to go and wants to have puberty blockers, but there's, let's say a court order from another state preventing him from doing so, let's say because the parents don't agree, um, then that minor is eligible to get uh, puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones, regardless of the court order, regardless of any action of another state. So the, here's the big question. Why are we an outlier? And let me suggest a few things and then, uh, and then I'll shut up. Um, number one, I think uh, the fact that we have a decentralized political system is highly relevant here. Um, and that, of course, coincides with a managed market healthcare system. Um, in Finland, all procedures um, are covered by public insurance, right? They have nationalized healthcare insurance. And that means that um, anything that's going to be paid for has to be approved by what's known as the Council for Choices in Healthcare or COHERE. That's the governmental body that does reviews, does systematic reviews of evidence behind certain procedures, decides whether there's good evidence for them or not. And on that basis decides what, what to fund. That's not how we do things. Um, in the United States, um, there is, uh, there's a high degree of, de of, of decentralization. Um, just to give you one example, um, Medicaid, which is used in 25 states plus the District of Columbia um, to prohibit discrimination against gender identity medicine, meaning uh, 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 kids are eligible in these states for um, Medicaid covered transition. Um, the Obama administration's uh, uh, um, uh, 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 Obamacare, excuse me. Obamacare has a provision in it, 1557, that says you cannot discriminate on the basis of sex. And the Obama administration's um, 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 health and uh, human um, services, I was gonna say health and human sacrifices, health and human services um, interpreted provision 1557 to mean gender identity. Meaning if any healthcare provider um, uh, uh, discriminates on the basis of gender identity with gender affirming care, um, then, then they're in violation of civil rights law. So we have a highly decentralized system that makes unified policy on this issue very difficult. Um, we also have uh, a, a public interest politics, right? Where groups like the ACLU um, that has been at the forefront of litigating these cases, um, human rights campaign, all these group uh, organizations, um, have a lot of entry into the political system, right? As, uh, um, as, as I learned uh, from, from uh, you, Shep, um, every veto point in the American political system is simultaneously an opportunity point and public interest organizations are extremely efficient in identifying what those points are and getting their policy preferences advanced with no accountability. Nobody votes for the ACLU, nobody can vote them out. So unlike uh, you know, the, the government in, F in Finland or Sweden, if they, uh, if they uh, um, uh, make unpopular moves on, on, in this area of regulation, the governments there can be voted out. That's not true of the ACLU and federal courts. Um, 
Trans activists have been very effective at tapping into our civil rights traditions. Um, uh, Attorney General Loretta Lynch famously compared the bathroom question uh, in the trans issue to the bathroom to bathroom segregation under Jim Crow. Um, partisan polarization is highly uh, relevant here. When Texas came out with its um, policy the, uh, through executive action to investigate parents um, who transitioned their kids, California responded with SB 107 by making California a sanctuary state, right? So this logic of, of spiraling polarization. But we also have an individualistic and entrepreneurial political culture, which helps to explain, I think, why um, doctors here are more willing to be risk takers, um, more willing to stick their neck out and say gender affirming care is life saving and medically necessary, even when there's no good evidence for it. Um, I had a conversation with uh, Rita Kertu Kaltiala, who's the head of Finland's biggest gender clinic. And she said, you know, um, uh, now uh, doctors are not allowed to perform these procedures. Um, and I asked her, is there, I asked her, is there a law criminalizing doctors who do? And she said, no. So I said, how are you, how are you so confident that doctors are not just going it alone, just doing whatever they want, taking risks? And her response was, because we're not like you Americans. Here, doctors follow rules. Finnish people like rules, and we follow them. Um, and I think that that goes quite, quite a long way towards explaining why we have so many doctors willing to engage in risky medical practices. Um, and then the final two aspects are the capture of our knowledge gatekeeping institutions. This took off especially after the George Floyd events. Um, we have peer-reviewed publications now publishing um, articles that are just demonstrably false, um, easily refuted. Um, they, they wouldn't even pass muster as an undergraduate paper, and yet they, they get through the peer review process, which is quite shocking. And then finally, the failure of investigative journalism. Um, uh, anything left of center until very recently has been uh, unwilling to raise any critical questions, um, rarely ever even asking why other countries have changed course. Um, there's, uh, there are now starting to be some cracks in the dam, um, but it's too little too late and we're not seeing enough momentum on that. So with that, I'll shut up um, uh, and I, I welcome your questions. Thank you, Lior. Thank you very much, Lior. That's a, a powerful presentation. But, but now I'm sure we have questions. What do you want us to do if we want to ask a question? Just raise our hand. Yeah, you can, since you barged in, you can start and then Jerry is next. But keep yourself muted and um, raise your hand or tell me in chat. Okay. Um, so you've created a new villain in, in my uh, pantheon called the American Academy of Pediatrics. I mean, this, they should be right. The most, uh, the seminal kind of legitimating organization um, from your, and I know you're there, you, they consider you their enemy, but what have you learned about them? Why are they so uh, professionally irresponsible? That's a great question. It's a question I get a lot. Why is the AAP captured on this issue? Um, I think there's a number of explanations. One is I think we're seeing with the AAP what we're seeing in a, a, a wide variety of other institutions um, on this you know, kind of ideological infiltration, or I should say exfiltration out of the academy and into other institutions, including corporations, media, uh, editorial boards. And it's basically a story of a small number of very well-connected, well-organized, ideologically motivated activists in the profession, um, uh, and a large majority of, you know, um, pediatricians who either don't have expertise in this area of medicine, so they don't they don't want to risk their professional reputations, thinking that maybe there's something they're missing, or who are afraid to speak out. I've spoken to many pediatricians, or at least a handful of them, who have told me. Um, I, I can't say anything about this because I'm going to lose my job. Um, so that's one thing, right? This kind of collective action problem, a silent majority, small organized minority. Um, what I've also come to, to learn is that these professions are um, very heavily female dominated. Um, at, so the AAP and the American Psychological Association are two thirds to three quarter female. Um, school teachers are roughly the same. Um, and, you know, women, uh, to the, much to their advantage, I think, have uh, a, a capacity for, for empathy in ways that many men don't. 
but that empathy can also be weaponized. Um, and I think that that a lot of what we're seeing is weaponized empathy. Um, and you know, you can see this too on if you just start to survey the forces on the ground of, of who's promoting this stuff. Um, you see many, many, many more women than men. Um, although you also see women at the forefront of pushing back against it, which is also interesting. Um, but regardless, I, I think those are those two features are probably what 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 explain why the AAP. Uh, and the American Psychological Association have been captured on this issue. Thanks, Lior. And you've added a word to my, two words to my vocabulary, weaponized empathy. Oh, my word. Thank you. Jerry, please. And um, please keep it short because we will go over time, but I bet I'm sure there are going to be a million questions. All right. Shalom and uh, toda. I want to clarify what your major point is. Are you merely saying that you oppose medical intervention with transgenderism, you oppose puberty blockers and surgery, but sometimes you speak as if you're making a stronger claim that you think that transgenderism is merely social contagion and you compared it to witchcraft and you compared it to other kinds of hysterical uh, phenomena like uh, recovered memories. There are no witches. Is there such a thing as transgenderism? And I just want to add my own experience. I treated transgender males in the 70s before this flip when it was very rare. And my experience is that is that there is something as transgenderism, especially the early onset. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, no, I don't, I don't want to say that, yeah, well, let me put it this way. If you're asking me whether there is a form of gender dysphoria, a kind of a profound and lasting discontent with one's sex that brings with it a lot of distress um, uh, over one's lifetime that results in impairment of social function. Um, yes, I, I think that that does appear to be the case. You would know that better than I would, but I, I see no evidence why that isn't the case. If you're also asking whether this type of dysphoria can start to appear in childhood, um, I think the jury is out on that question. I, I'm not sure we can know that. Um, I don't think we can know that until the, the kind of the, the identity of, of these people has been, uh, until once they've passed through puberty and possibly into mid adulthood, when, the, you know, because the brain develops roughly until age 25. Um, so, you know, th there's two kind of schools of thought among those of us who are objecting to what's going on now in the medical field. One is the whole kind of no child is born in the wrong body. Nobody's born in the wrong body, meaning there's no such thing as transgenderism. Men are men, women are women. Um, uh, you know, we can entertain these delusions for some reason, but, but we shouldn't. The other school of thought is if it were possible to know who among kids has life is going to have lifelong dysphoria, then you know we could potentially in an ethical and responsible manner, we can have these uh, uh, medical interventions for those particular kids, but we have no way of knowing. And we probably will know, know, uh, ever, never have a, a reliable way of knowing. And so we just shouldn't do it, right? Because the uh, harm we'd cause far outweighs any benefits. Um, I'm not sure, in order to push back against what's going on in the American medical establishment today, I'm not sure you have to decide between those two positions. Either one of them is going to get you to the same conclusion. But if you're asking me whether I think that, um, that, that, uh, that, 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 that a gender identity exists and that it is the determining factor in being a man or a woman, my answer is no. I don't think so. But does that mean that we should never make exceptions? We should never treat people who have dysphoria as if they are the opposite sex in certain contexts, subject, subject to certain reasonable limitations? Yeah, I'm willing to do that. Why not? Thank you. Yeah. Jean, please, and then Joanne. OK. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation and also for the essay that you wrote that I read in June, the day that I was slated to give a talk about what's going on in the main public schools. Mm -hmm. So I was especially interested in your hypothesis that perhaps uh, it was the shutdown of the schools that accelerated this um, uh, unhappy 
situation. But I wonder if that's really true. Um, let me suggest something else. And I really, I'm not, I, I'm not a social science researcher in any way. Um, but it, if kids have dropped out while they're while they're going to school online, I can see that they're alienated, they're bored, they're detached from school. But I don't know that those are the conditions that really prompt somebody to rethink their sexual identity of gender identity. Um, but when they go back to school, and I'm uh, what I was focusing on in Maine was something called ESSER, the Elementary and Secondary School Relief Act. And part of that was a, a huge chunk of money for social and emotional learning. And although that was set out, described in what most people understood that to mean is you're going to make your kids safe as they will wear masks. When will they not wear masks? How will they re-enter into the schools? But it was also used to push the gender ideology stuff. And so it seems that you might have kids who are tuned out. I certainly see it with my students at Bowdoin. And this is several years ago. I mean, they're still carrying that burden of alienation and remoteness, and they are are struggling. So when these kids go back to school, it seems to me that they're much more ripe for this kind of, uh, you could say, almost um, uh, it, 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 turning them into victims. Uh, you know, they have other problems. And I think your essay was very helpful in terms of identifying, especially girls from troubled backgrounds who think that they will suddenly catapult themselves to heroic status in the schools. But And that's another reason why I don't think it really worked as well during the period of remote learning. So I just wonder if you have any reaction to that. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Thanks for that. Um, let me say uh, two things. Number one, um, the missing link here, of course, is social media. Um, TikTok has been an extremely important platform for, um, and Reddit, I should say, but TikTok especially has been an extremely influential plat platform for these mostly young girls to be exposed to kind of these heroic stories of other girls who went through this transformation and now they, um, they've come out the other side as their authentic selves and so on and so forth, right? So, and we know that there's a lot of trans influencers um, in these uh, social media platforms. Um, some of them are adults, some of them are, are older teenagers um, who, who really counsel these young, young people, especially young girls through the process, to, uh, you know, instruct them what, what to say. Um, you know, kind of give them the whole social justice spiel about how the worst thing you can be is a cis person and, um, and, and it's all rooted in a system of oppression. And this ties into a lot of what they, especially if they come from a state like California, a lot of what they've been to told because of California's new um, social justice curriculum, which uh, basically mandates the teaching of critical race theory um, in, in many of its um, components. So <clears throat> social media is uh, hugely influential. And of course, during the pandemic, um, uh, well, I, sh I shouldn't say, of course, it seems to be the case that during the pandemic, um, these teenagers were exposed to social media much, much more than when they were uh, in the classroom where there was at least some supervision and monitoring of their activities. But what, you are, what you're saying is actually true that um, the school environment itself uh, can serve as a catalyst here. Um, and what ends up happening, and I know this just based on conversations I've had with parents and with detransitioners, meaning young women who have gone through this process and regretted it, um, is that what happens is that they get exposed to all this stuff and primed for it um, online. And then they, but then they need to be, actually go through the social transition itself, right? They need to show, they need to put their money where their mouth is. Um, and they end up going back to school and then a few things happen. One is that they get what's known as love bombing. Um, that's when they declare themselves trans and the, the local uh, GSA club, the Gender Sexuality Alliance Club, immediately kind of envelops them and says, you're authentic and courageous and amazing. Um, 
there's going to be a, a number of teachers and school counselors who immediately come to, their, to this um, uh, child's aid and says, you're courageous and authentic and I love you. Nowadays, the, language, the preferred language that they use is, we are your real family now, we're your family. They use, the, they use the, that language. Um, and so th the presence of, so to speak, affirming adults is made possible by the return of these young girls to school. Whereas if they had stayed home, they probably, their parents want, probably would be at the very least suspicious. Um, uh, whereas in school, be, uh, partly because of the incentives, the civil rights laws that they face, but partly because of school culture and, and who the teaching um, profession tends to attract, they're much more likely to encounter an immediate and uncritical affirmative environment. Do add, please. Um, Leah, I've learned so much from you, as, as, and you were very affirming of me when I was, a, uh, you know, several years ago, a struggling clinician trying to make sense of all this. Um, there's one aspect of what you said that I question, and that, that has to do with the, the um, issue of confidentiality between kids and parents. Um, I, I haven't read a lot of the uh, research about this, but because I don't have m many of these kids in my particular practice, but a couple. And so when that happens, I'm sort of uh, all of a sudden intensely trying to find out more, find out more and listen closely. And one of the um, helpful articles from the American Pediatric Association uh, <laughs> showed that there was a very uh, troublingly, a troubling um, uh, number of kids who identify as trans who also uh, report experiencing physical and sexual abuse mm. in their homes. And so when you think about talking to a young teenager who's in a home where in, in a particular instance I'm thinking of where I began to wonder about the question of abuse um, on the parent's side, um, the, the assumption that you're going to have wise, compassionate parents who are gonna respond well to a child saying something that's troubling, controversial, um, maybe even uh, doing so reactive to uh, feelings about their body that have come up through a, a terrible his history. Um, I think the assumption that school authorities, school counselors, psychologists uh, should, out of some ethical responsibility, always inform parents uh, has risks. Mm. That's a great point. Um, so let me say a few things about this. Um, I'm not aware of kind of the, 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 the research that gets into um, the, the family environment of these kids and what exactly it is. And, and I think no less important the history um, of that, uh, of those interactions, because one thing that it would be very uh, useful to know is, you know, when, when, so to speak, trans kids report high levels of sexual abuse or, uh, or physical abuse at home, one immediate question to ask is, what's the causal link here? Is the abuse because they came out as trans or is their coming out of trans somehow linked to pre-existing physical and sexual abuse? We don't know that. Um, I, I don't know any research on that question um, posed in that way, but may, there, there, may be, there may be research on that. So that's one, just a, one thing to keep in mind. I mean, you're certainly right that, um, that it, it would be hard for a parent to immediately kind of express uh, you know, to, to affirm their child and their new gender and what have you. But based on, I think, both the research and the common sense, um, it's, it, it's not good for parents to do that. That's, that's irresponsible, I think, um, partly because we know that the vast majority of, kid, of these kids will desist and come to terms with their sex. Um, and partly because I think it's the, you know, the role of the parent is to, is to be, proceed with extreme caution here is to say, you know, I love you and support you no matter what, but you know, let's let's think about what's go what's what's going on in your life, and maybe there's things that we're not seeing here. I mean, um, so it all I guess it all depends on what you would define as a supportive fam family environment, and this becomes a very um, important concept because you see this in a lot of research articles and a lot of political a lot of um, policy activism 
where um, activists will say things like, um, these kids come from a non-supportive home. So um, there, there are school districts across the country that now have explicit policies that say um, uh, teachers should only uh, report on a gender transformation to the student's parents if the teachers believe that the student comes from a, if, if the teacher has reason to believe that the uh, student's parents are going to be supportive. What does that mean? Um, does that mean ag agree uncritically with the child's new gender? Or does that mean say something like, um, you know, I, you might be going through a phase. Um, I'm not going to use your, your new name and pronouns, but I love you no matter what. And I'm here for you and I'll support you. According to activists, that's an unsupportive parent. Um, which leads to the final thing that you said, um, which is, you know, what are teachers supposed to do in this kind of situation, right? If they do think that there's actual abuse going on, uh, you know, my answer to that is increasingly becoming called child protective services. That's not the role of a school. Um, teachers are not the ones who are supposed to decide whether, uh, whether a, a student's parents are supportive and in what way they're supportive. If a teacher actually has grounds to believe that there's physical or sexual abuse going on in the, in the, uh, in the home, call Child Protective Services. It's not your role. Um, but if, if no call to Child Protective Services is made, I'm, I'm inclined to think that it's probably because the teacher doesn't think that there's actual abuse going on, but merely a lack of support for the new declared gender. Um, and again, that lack of support, given what we know from the research, is good. Thank you. Avi, please. A comment and two questions. First, I was struck by what you said earlier, that uh, some of these girls would look at social justice and uh, they dislike the white supremacist movement and all that. And I found it sort of incongruous that they would then want to become white males, which <laughs> are usually the target of, uh, of, of all this objection. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the second, the, the question is, uh, we frequently have to draw lines in the gray. We decide 18, you can vote. Below that, you can't. 21, you can drink. Below that, you can't. We, we do that because things are, are, it's hard to come up with definitive lines. Would an appropriate policy be to say, you're a child and you may have all sorts of thoughts that may or may not hold to adulthood but a decision like this, you cannot implement until you are an adult. We can pick 18 or 21, whatever it is, but make that the policy because we have to decide something to resolve what seems to be really a mess. And the second question is, are there others like you who are pushing back? Is there, is there any kind of beginning of an, an intellectual movement among researchers and scholars who are beginning to raise the questions that you're raising and producing scholarly papers in support of that. Okay, um, regarding your first comment, yeah, you would think that uh, opting into being a white male is exact is is, is wrongheaded from their perspective. Um, but there's a uh, there's a kink here, which is that uh, they're opting into being a trans male. They're opting into the trans category, which you know, in and of itself puts them very high on the on the victim um, totem pole. Um, so, so that's that's fairly easy to dispense with. You know, there's obviously a contradiction there, right? Because if they're a trans male, then they're not really a male, and if they're really a male, then they haven't opted out of of being an oppressor, right? So, uh, <laughs> um, but these are don't forget these are 14 year old girls we're talking about. They're not professors of philosophy. Um, Okay, so why not delay decisions? Uh, why not have an arbitrary cutoff line? I mean, that is essentially the position that many people take. Um, it's not very arbitrary either. Um, you know, uh, we can say 18 is the age of, of uh, adulthood for a lot of other important decisions, credit cards, things like that. Why not with this one? Um, some people go even farther and say, look, um, you know, we know that cognitive development happens until age 25. And so these decisions should be delayed until after age 25, um, not 18. Um, what I will say is that 
maybe let me just kind of give a very short um, uh, background in terms of the, the, the original rationale for pediatric transition as articulated by the Dutch, Dutch researchers at the University of Amsterdam in the 1990s um, was this. The lifelong distress that these people, uh, transsexuals as they were called at the time, uh, are likely to suffer that distress is not because of how society views them necessarily. Rather, it's distress because of their physical bodies. Their, their physical bodies cause them distress and specifically their secondary sex characteristics. So uh, if we're talking about male to female tra transitioners, the fact that they have big hands, a lot of muscle, uh, an Adam's apple, a deep voice, um, high cheekbones, right? All these, all these secondary sex characteristics make them feel um, dysphoric um, and severely so. So the thinking among the Dutch clinicians was, look, we need a way to prevent these features from coming into, the ex into existence in the first place. That's going to be the most effective. It's, it's almost like a preventative type of medicine, right? That's going to prevent them um, not only from feeling distressed in the future, but it's actually gonna reduce the likelihood of them ever needing these complicated, expensive, and very risky surgeries. Um, so you know, if we can nip it in the bud, if we can get them early on, um, we can think of it as a type of preventative medicine. So there is a, a kind of a rationale for, for these procedures, but of course then that gets into the whole question of can children meaningfully understand what, what they're sacrificing here? And especially considering that the costs, the sacrifices are almost never um, articulated to these kids in a way that's clear and honest, I think it's, it's, it's really troubling. Um, so, you know, the final question, is there a coalition opposing this stuff? Yeah, um, it's just that, you know, you don't hear about uh, these people very often in the left of center media, or if you do, it's, it's, uh, it's because they, uh, we have been demonized. Um, in the right of center media, there's quite a bit of coverage uh, of, of people uh, acting in this area, um, journalists, researchers, organizations. Um, it, it's becoming quite robust, to be honest. Um, so there is opposition, but you know, the, the obstacles are formidable because um, you know, you're talking about um, a lot of these elite institutions, um, AAP, academia, peer-reviewed journals, the Democratic Party, the New York Times editorial board, it's very, very difficult to get them to even consider that there's another perspective, let alone to kind of give that perspective um, its, its charitable due. So yes, there's movement underway, but it's, uh, and, and we have made some progress over the past few months, but it's gonna take a lot more. I have two questions. I'm using my privilege here. Um, what was the argument of the Trump appointed federal judge that um, is federal society judge? I'm curious about that. Yeah. And my, my second question is more normative and personal. Um, are there people who have a very strict sense of men are men, women are women, there is no third thing, who will not refer to trans men as she? I, I don't know what to do about this anymore. I, you know, out of kindness, out of not, it was fine to say, Deirdre McCoskey, she, no skin off my back. I'm becoming increasingly hostile to have to do this. I don't want to do this anymore because I see where this leads, but it's almost impossible when there's name changes, when there's, you see this everywhere. So what's the practical, what's a practical way to navigate this difficulty? Um, okay, <laughs> good questions. Um, Regarding the uh, Eknis Tucker lawsuit, that was the uh, lawsuit out of um, Alabama. Um, the judge there is Judge Lyles Burke, um, Trump appointee. And you know his, his temporary injunction basically was based on two arguments. One is an argument about parental rights, um, that this really infringes, this, this prohibition infringes on the right of parents to direct the medical, uh, medical care of their children. And in a way that uh, to the extent that this becomes a precedent and it might, I think that that's actually quite useful um, because I, I would imagine just based on my understanding of the field for every one parent who wants to transition um, his or her kid, there's 10 parents who want to put on the brakes or stop it. So if we could get kind of a robust judicial doctrine of parental rights on this issue and there are 
there's an organization, a couple organizations, uh, legal advocacy organizations already working on this. Um, there are a few lawsuits underway um, in a number of states on this question. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, the reason though that he struck down the prohibition on puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones is basically that um, it was against the considered judgment of um, 22 major medical organizations that filed an amicus brief on behalf of the ACLU. Um, and Judge Burke basically said, look, I'm not an expert, right? Judges are, are, are generalists. They don't have a lot of time on their schedules. They can't familiarize with themselves with the clinical literature. Um, but by virtue of their institutional incentives and position, they're almost guaranteed to defer to uh, 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 experts, especially when all of the major professional organizations line up on one side and a, a, a few smaller outliers line up on the other side. So that's not, that's not terribly surprising. Um, on your question of pronoun etiquette, I, I wrestle with this myself. Um, yes, there are some people who just will not use pronouns that don't uh, uh, coincide with biological reality. Um, I'm not one of those people. Um, if I'm interacting directly with a transgender woman, I'm going to use she and, um, and her in, in her presence, right? Because we don't use these pronouns when directly addressing someone that's in their presence. Um, I won't use they. I don't do that because that already gets into kind of a queer theory ideology that, that I think is just too, it's too jarring. Um, so I don't do neo pronouns. Um, I'll just refer to a person with their name over and over and over again, even though that's awkward too. Um, so, you know, anytime somebody asks me this question, my advice is if you're in a one-to-one -one setting with a person who is civil with you, um, there's no reason to be, um, you know, not pleasant, uncivil about it. But at the same time, it's important to recognize that we don't want to, um, we don't want to normalize and we don't want to, um, create the impression that there's nothing um, nothing wrong here, that, that, that being male or female really is just a matter of an internal feeling, because that, again, it bleeds out from popular culture into adolescent culture, and it informs how teenagers are thinking about these, the, these um, uh, what they're going through when they go through puberty and what their options are, and we have to be very, very careful because they hear that messaging. Exactly. And I increasingly think that trying to split the difference, as in so many of these issues, is just not going to work and you have to bite the bullet. But OK, um, Keith and then Tom. Thanks so much. And thank you for the very informative presentation. Um, I have a bite the bullet kind of question stepping back from policy here. And you've referred kind of a, or alluded more to the precedence of the homosexual rights movement to this, to the trans movement. And also maybe to, I think you've alluded to, and you've written about also some tension between homosexual rights and trans rights. And so I guess I'm wondering if in your study of this, has, um, has your work caused you to question uh, the application of rights language uh, also to homosexuality and the consequences that follow from that in terms of legislation, education, social practice, and convention at all? Or do you draw a very hard line based upon facts of either nature or convention between the trans movement and how it should be treated and the homosexual movement? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big question. Um, you know, uh, I think one thing maybe to observe is just that uh, well, two things. One is that the, the gay rights movement, especially after kind of the late 70s and early 80s, it, it congealed more or less into a libertarian uh, movement with a strong libertarian streak, which is not to say that they didn't want some kind of cultural transformation, but it was more, mostly about, you know, leave us alone. So, you know, get rid of all these state prohibitions on same sex um, sexual acts, get out of our bedroom. Um, um, you know, and then the two major issues after that became employment non-discrimination. So don't refuse to hire or don't fire us or don't not promote us just because we're gay, um, which I think is a perfectly sensible and reasonable position. I agree with it. Um, uh, with, of course, some exceptions for religion and things like that um, as necessary. And of course, the marriage question. On the marriage question, you know, 
my position was always that uh, this is a policy question. It's not just this abstract question of rights. There's costs and benefits to legalizing um, same-sex marriage. And my objection at the time when the Supreme Court came out with its decision in 2015 was, was not to the policy decision itself, but to the way in which it was framed as there could be no legitimate objection to this, right? That, that there's gonna be no associated costs, um, no unintended consequences. Anybody who raises any objections is, um, is a bigot. Um, so that, that's a position I never found very compelling. Um, um, but again, you know, the, the, the gay rights movement for at least for the last 30, 40 years has had a pretty strong live and let live streak. And the other, I think it very, in a way that the trans movement clearly does not. And that um, ties into the second really important difference, which is that, um, you know, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're, if you have religious faith convictions on this issue, you know, you might think that that a homosexual style, a lifestyle is very damaging to the soul and things like that. Um, you know, fine. Um, I don't believe that, but, but, it, but, but some people do, and I don't, I don't begrudge them that belief. I don't think the same can be said here. Um, to undergo medical transition is by definition to impose on yourself a whole host of medical risks and um, uh, psychological risks and, and to have to live with the consequences for the rest of your life. And if you're an adult, you know, you can make that calculus for yourself. But if you're a child, you can't possibly. What 14-year-old girl can say, I know I don't want to have kids when I'm in my 20s and 30s. I know I, I never want to have kids in life. You, you know, your mind is likely to change. Um, so in that, in that regard, there's an obvious and huge difference between these two movements. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Keith and I were going down the same path. Um, the, the gay marriage support in this country was very fast, swept along very fast after Margaret Marshall and the SJC led the way in Massachusetts. But it seems to me the transgender Transgender support um, has a great big obstacle in um, supporting um, uh, transgender people in um, saying that they're women in sports. Um, that's not religious. It's a fairness issue. It seems to me there's a lot of sort of progressive and woke people who have taken, I'll say, our side on this one. I just wondered whether you think that's uh, sort of a big obstacle to the the, uh, the wide acceptance of transgender genderism and, and medical treatment for it, in fact. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. I think the sports is really kind of a, um, a, 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 a is one of the Achilles heel of the trans movement. And uh, I think we saw that, especially in the events surrounding Leah Thomas, um, which I've written about on a number of occasions. I'm actually supposed to go to UPenn in a few weeks and give a talk there. Um, they want, I think they want me to talk about Leah Thomas, but I'm gonna say, I think that's in bad taste. Um, look, it's interesting that when you look at trans rights organizations like the ACLU and GLSEN, um, a human rights campaign, I believe has also come out with statements to this effect. It's very interesting that in almost every other aspect of public policy and public life, they will say gender identity determines whether a person is male or female. There's no such thing as biological sex. Anybody who thinks there is, is an ignorant bigot. Um, case closed, but not when it comes to sports. When it comes to sports, their position is total prohibition on women, trans women participating in female sports is unconstitutionally broad. That's it, that's their position. Meaning according to their logic, it's acceptable and maybe even necessary in the interest of fairness and um, safety to exclude at least some individuals who have a female gender identity from the female category of sports. So clearly they have two separate philosophical anthropologies, one for sports and one for every other domain of public life and public policy. Um, I've called out this contradiction a number of times. I've, I've never seen it addressed anywhere by, by activists on the other side. They just, they're perfectly happy to let it um, persist. Um, but you are certainly right that the sports issue is where the rubber meets the road. And I should say one, one more thing as a student of Sheps, um, it's been really surprising, and Shep, maybe you can um, uh, chime in here too. It's been really surprising to see conservatives line up behind uh, women's sports over the last few years, 
in the wake of the trans issue. Um, and I don't just mean kind of, you know, quietly agree that Title IX should protect women's sports against trans, um, identi uh, against uh, female identified uh, males. I mean, conservatives making positive arguments on behalf of the benefits of women's sports, um, which I think is, 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 is not a good idea. Um, I, I think Title IX sports have corrupted the university. I don't think it's good that conservatives are, are now um, uh, lining up behind it as if it's, you know, our, our saving grace here. Um, but it does hold activists' feet to the fire and force them either to have a consistent position on what it is that makes a person female um, or to concede, and this is, I think, what, what you can see in some of the court cases on athletics on this issue, um, to concede that if gender identity is not the only thing that determines whether someone is male or female, the reason for that is because it depends, and it depends on what the trade-offs are. But if it depends on what the trade-offs are, then that is also true of other areas of policy like bathrooms and prisons and, and all these other areas that are being litigated. And, and then it, it's no longer just a question of rights. It's a question of policy, of trade-offs. Um, but of course, the other side is not willing to frame it that way. They, can, they, they insist that it's a simple, straightforward question of rights. So I, I think keeping open the, the sports issue um, is extremely valuable for those of us pushing back against gender identity policies because it forces the other side to recognize that there are in fact trade-offs and therefore that we cannot resolve these issues by abstract rights talk. Uh, we can take a few more questions because we can go over time a little bit more, but um, if there are none, I do have a the prison because since you brought it up, yeah. is there any legal recourse for women um, who had have had to deal with a male in their midst um, and have been assaulted or raped or I don't know whatever? Um, are there area are, are there paths open for women to uh, to sue? I know. So I, actually, this is one area of policy that I'm not very familiar with. Um, I, I know that there have been some laws and some court cases on this question in the last year or so. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know, to be honest. I don't know. Here's a question, uh, Lior. Uh, what about pronouns? Uh, you've mentioned them several times, but um, is it is it, it would seem from what you say that it's not harmless for universities to require people to state their pronouns. It yeah. makes it seem that you have the right to choose your sex. Right. Um, so I, I, was a I was focusing that argument, especially on K through 12 education, because that's where, you know, uh, kind of vulnerable um, um, teenagers, especially female teenagers can, uh, where, where the social transition can, um, lead them to want to medicalize. Um, I think in the context of colleges, it's slightly different. Not maybe there are there is some overlap. It's slightly different though. Um, but yes, I you know I think there is a kind of a school to clinic pipeline argument to be made for universities as well. Um, of course, there are, you know complicating factors that they're adults that there's no parental notification requirements. Um, um, but yeah. That, that's what I would say, that, that the, the, the school to clinic pipeline concern does, I think should come up in the context of universities, but not nearly as much as um, in K through 12 schools. Thanks very much. No, 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 we have, we have Shep. Shep. Oh, we have Shep, okay. I'll, I'll be very short. Uh, Lior uh, invited me to say a word about athletics, but um, the assumption behind athletics is that because there are biological differences between men and women, we shouldn't be on the same team. Um, so it really makes a difference if we're talking about policy about areas where we're segregating by sex or not segregating by sex. So most Bostock decision says you can't discriminate on basis of uh, uh, transgender status for if people have equal ability to do a job. And to me, I'm quite happy to say that. But the big question is, um, when you are obliged to segregate by sex, what do you mean by that? And the reason that athletics is such a big problem is because the reason we segregate is because we recognize there's this big biological difference. So if you say biology doesn't matter, that's uh, the response to that is we shouldn't have 
two right. different sets of teams. And I just say uh, one more thing. You talk about the corruption of uh, athletics in colleges by college sports related to Title IX. I would I think the biggest corrupting influence is the NCAA, which is really bought into we're going to be the promoter of women's sports and we're going to do it on a male model, which I think is a fundamental mistake. Yeah. No, I mean, those are good points. Um, you know, I, I think pretty much all con policy controversies on the trans issue, um, schools, prisons, uh, medicine, um, they all revolve essentially around the question of, you know, there's a few areas in life where sex actually matters nowadays. Um, and so what should be the definition of sex, meaning of male and female? Um, should it be a matter of anatomy, chromosomes, functions, all these kinds of um, uh, uh, traits, or should it be a matter of um, sin sincere self-assertion, authenticity, uh, whatever you want to call it? Um, and again, as I explained when I went over kind of the philosophical assumptions of gender affirming care, um, it really is crucial to that medical protocol, um, the belief that um, sex is a social construct, but gender identity is an innate quality. Of course, they're never going to use the word soul, but they do think of gendered souls um, in sexed bodies. Um, and, 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 that, um, and that it matters um, whether you're male or female. So, right, so contrary to queer theory. And then it matters that others recognize you as being male or female. And that's why they recommend um, medic, medical and surgical procedures so that you appear in the typical in the body typical of members of, of the sex that you claim to be. So um, you're right, there's very few areas of life that where sex actually matters. And, and sports um, is, a, is an obvious example of them. And you know, I don't think you're ever going to get a trans rights organization agree um, that biology matters in sports, but at the same time in their arguments, they imply exactly that. Leo, thank you on this talk on how deeply irrational animals we are. <laughs> thank you. Say the last word. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Leo. A very powerful argument and a lovely combination of philosophy and policy. Thank you. Thank you, Harvey. Mm -hmm.